Hello, in this video we're going to be talking about elastic potential energy, one last type of energy to add to our conservation of energy problems. This is energy stored in a spring or something like a spring. Um, we're also going to be talking about how to deal with conservation of energy when external forces are doing work on your system. So here we go. So elastic potential energy, the idea is an elastic material can store energy, just like a gravitational field can store energy. Um, and later we'll see something like an electric field can store energy. Uh, you know, a rubber band stores energy. If you pull a rubber band apart, it takes you some work to do that. You have to put in some energy to the system to stretch it out. And the band is literally holding that energy for you. So if you let it go and shoot it at somebody, it will release that energy and go flying. Uh, you know, a spring can also store energy when it's compressed. So stretching or compressing an elastic material stores energy. We have something called the spring constant. We use lowercase k for the variable here. And this kind of quantifies how stretchy something is. Something very stiff and hard to compress or stretch would have a large spring constant. Something uh, very easy to stretch would have a, a small spring constant. We'll talk a little in a second about where the number comes from. It's measured in newtons per meter, but then that gives us uh, the equation here, which is just given in the data booklet, is the equation for elastic potential energy. Notice it just says E sub P, so do all the gravitational potential energy equations. So you need to know from context, the obvious stuff would be like the K and the delta X um, that tell me that this is the potential energy stored in a spring. Uh, so this is the amount of energy, elastic potential energy. One half is, uh, you might notice this is very similar to the uh, kinetic energy equation in its format. But K is this value of the spring constant. Newtons per meter is how we measure that. And delta X is the distance that the object has been stretched or compressed from its equilibrium position. So all these springs will have a, a position that they're where they're at rest. And if I push it to either side, I can compress or stretch the spring. The distance from equilibrium that I push is delta x. That's all one variable. And then I take that compression or stretch distance and square it. So that's a simple formula to give me the energy stored in a spring. Uh, all right, sort of a place where it comes from and something to be uh, at least a little aware of is Hooke's Law. Hooke's Law... Um, is what tells me about the force from a spring. Uh, this is not in the data booklet. This is something that can come up. It's really helpful if you know this equation. So here's an example of an unstretched spring just kind of hanging there. And we assume that the spring is massless, so it's just hanging from the ceiling. And it turns out uh, this is the equation for Hooke's Law that you would want to put somewhere in your notes and have uh, at least vaguely in your memory that the force of a spring is equal to its spring constant times x in this case uh, is this stretching distance in the equation in the IB we call it delta x. All right, but so this is the same kind of stretching or compression distance. And the idea is the force increases the more that it's stretched, which is probably something you've experienced if you think about pulling on a rubber band or anything like that. And it's a linear thing, so uh, or a proportional thing even. So if I double the distance, if I have um, it takes a certain amount of force to stretch the spring this far. I would need to double the force to stretch it two times further, and so on and so on. And since that force increases as distance increases, we can imagine maybe that has something to do with why x is squared in the energy equation. All right, but this equation gives me the force from a spring, and it increases proportionally with the distance from equilibrium that it's been stretched. All right, so when we're talking about conservation of energy, we are talking about mechanical energy. And now that we have this spring potential energy, we can add it into the picture of mechanical energy. So mechanical energy is defined as all of the kinetic and potential energies of a system added together. So kinetic energy, gravitational potential, elastic potential, and I could have multiple of those things if there's multiple objects in my system. So we call that mechanical energy. And if an object has mechanical energy, it has the ability to, to do work. That's another way to think of it. 
So you hold the bowling ball up off the ground, it's got a bunch of gravitational potential energy that thing could surely do work if you let it go. It could transfer energy. And we're going to look at one other version of the kind of conservation of energy equation that we came up with. And this is just a system. This is not like a necessarily a law of physics equation, but it's a good problem solving approach, which is to take the initial energy, set it equal to the final energy. But we can modify that by adding work on the left side of the equation. So this will take into account if I have a whole bunch of kinetic and potential energy in the beginning. But then there's some outside force that comes in, pushes on one of my objects and transfers energy to it. Well, then I'll end up more, with more energy at the end. So this term can take into account if work is done on your system, which is really useful. And if, if energy is taken away from your system, the work would be negative and I would end up with less energy than I started with. So this is just a recap, but remember if multiple forces do work, I could have a couple different uh, terms kind of inside of this work, just like I have many terms inside of the initial energy and the final energy. Keep in mind, if you have multiple objects, you need to add all of their energies together. So you might have two or three kinetic energies if you have two or three objects moving around. So let's look at some examples to kind of see how this works. Um, here's what a classic compression spring problem might look like or an elastic potential energy problem might look like. I push a crate against a spring and then I let it go and it slides across the surface. And I want to find how quickly it's going when it reaches some point over here. So I push this thing backwards, it stores some energy in the spring, then I let it go, all that energy is released and it's going to slide through point A. Like so. Um, so what I want to do is figure out uh, how much energy I'm dealing with. All right, in this case, I can think about potential and kinetic energy. And it's the case where at the beginning, I'm pushed against a, a spring. So I'm storing energy as elastic potential energy. Um, I'm on the ground. So we're going to say that there's zero potential gravitational energy. And it's also at rest, so there's no kinetic energy. So in the beginning, it's all elastic potential energy. Then my final point would be over here at A. That's where I wanted to find that. And my final point, I am moving, so I have kinetic energy, but I'm still on the ground, so there's no gravitational potential energy. And I'm not stretched or compressed against the spring, so there's no elastic potential energy. So in this case, I just go from all potential to all kinetic energy. And in fact, there's not even any work done because we're, uh, there's, it's a frictionless surface. So this would be a case where I just set 1 half k delta x squared equal to 1 half mv squared. I start with all spring potential energy. I end with all kinetic energy. Notice now that I added this uh, elastic potential energy, mass doesn't cancel out, where you might be getting used to that in conservation of energy problems. But once we start getting to more involved problems like this with uh, spring potential energy and work being done, the mass doesn't cancel out. So I do need this mass. And we can easily solve for the speed here, plug in our values and get 5.2. So this is a classic, start with all one kind of energy, end with all the other. You can certainly jump right here in a problem like this. This is just kind of help you see where it comes from. But being able to recognize it starts as all spring energy, it becomes all kinetic energy, and then solving what you need. Okay, here's one that's a little more interesting. We have a skydiver jumping from uh, over 12,000 feet, and they uh, want to land, hopefully with a speed of uh, 7 or 8 meters per second. Uh, if you were to land much more quickly, you would have a bad day. So we want to figure out how much energy gets dissipated by friction as the sky ever falls. So we're dealing with work done by friction here, and air resistance, really. So I'm going to use this uh, equation, and I want to think through. I'm starting with all potential energy, gravitational potential energy up in the air, and I end with all kinetic energy because I land on the ground. So zero potential energy, it's all kinetic. And there is work done, and that work is done by the drag force. And I know that that's going to be negative work. That's going to take energy away. 
we'll see when we do this, I have way more potential energy in the beginning than I end up with as kinetic energy. And that's very, 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 very good for the skydiver. Because if all of that potential energy turned into kinetic energy, that would be your last skydiving trip. So I can manipulate this to solve for how much work is done by the drag force. It's just a difference in energy from what I start with and what I end with. And I see, amazingly, 2.8 million joules of energy are dissipated by friction, thankfully. If you had 2.8 million joules of kinetic energy and you hit the ground, uh, that, again, is not a good thing. So uh, we can solve for the work this way. We could, of course, go further if we knew the distance and find, like, the average force by using the work equation with Fs cosine theta. This is a good general way to include the work done by a force in your equations. So in our practice, we're going to see more and more exciting versions of conservation of energy problems. We're dealing with now elastic potential energy, gravitational potential energy, kinetic energy, and work done by forces. These equations are kind of guidelines for how you can set this up. The more you practice this and the more you think about this, you'll be able to intuitively kind of set up equations that talk about what's going on with the energy in your system, um, but definitely use this as a as a frame of reference and a guideline for how you can set these up in a consistent way. And in every problem, you'll have to think through in some good detail. Where am I choosing to start and what's the energy there? Where am I choosing to end and what's the energy there? And what forces might do work in between the beginning and ending point And how can I factor that in? And if you do all that and you focus on the concepts of, of work and what it means to transfer energy and what conservation of energy means, then you will be good to go. So have fun.